Hi, everybody. Coming to you from Jonesboro, Tennessee, the storytelling capital of the world and broadcasting from the historic McKinney Center, this is Storytown, Jonesboro's original storytelling radio hour. I'm Jules Corrier, and I am going to be your host tonight as we weave in and out of time, exploring some of the great African-American leaders, Afro-Latin artists, and great moments in black history. Black history isn't just American history, it's world history. Now before we get started, I want to remind everyone that our fun drive is going on right now. now this is our 10th anniversary year, but we've been hit. Yes, yes. That's our, that's our loving cast, because we still don't have you out in the audience with us tonight, but we really miss you. And this pandemic's been kind of hard on us because we're not getting money from ticket sales or other uh, event things, so we're still having our fund drive. And you know, the other reason we're doing this show is because our stories are important, and our history, our heritage, and our culture, they're important, and arts, shows like this one right here, that's how we interpret our culture, and that's how we pass it on. Now, we have a goal of $5,956. Okay, I'll call it 6000 To cover all the cost of the radio show, the podcast, the editing, the music, and everything for this amazing 10th season. Well, I'm thrilled to say that we are, because of generous people like you, already a third of the way there. And I know, yes! I know that with your help tonight, we're going to be able to make it the rest of the way. Um, for $2, of course, you can show us some much-needed love. And any, any amount, we're going to be grateful for. For $5, you'll get a link to an exclusive concert put on by Freddie Vanderford and Brandon Turner. And for $10, you will get a link to a special harmonica tutorial by Freddie himself. And for $15, you get all these links and an exclusive interview with me and Connie, the snake lady. Mm-hmm. And if you do this and put in the comments how much extra you would donate to see me touch the snake or even have Connie drape her snake over me, wait, what? Who put this in the script? Phyllis? I don't know, but Jules, you said it, so you have to do it. Oh, man. Okay, so I guess here's the deal. If you donate... $15, you get a link to the interview that I'm doing with Connie the Snake Lady. And if you donate extra, you can see me touch the snake. Ah! I know, I would not visit my daughter in her new house until she got rid of her pet snake. That's how much I don't like snakes. So we're going to have to raise an extra gosh. I don't know. I think I wouldn't do that for less than $100. So if you're watching... And if there's 100 of you watching and you each give a, a dollar, or if there's 25 of you watching and you each give four dollars, any combination that gets you to $100, please don't make me do any more math tonight. So if you, if you donate up to $100, I'm going to touch that snake. Jules, that's not all, remember? Mm, all right, all right, Phyllis. But, oh my gosh, uh, if you really want to torture me, you can collectively get together and donate, I don't know, what's a good number, Phyllis? Um, a million? Mm, let's be reasonable, Jules. Okay, fine. What do you suggest? Uh, $250. $250? Draped, Phyllis, you said draped. Draped around my shoulders. Would you do that for $250? I wouldn't. No. What do you think? 200 Paul, when did you get in on this? Payback. Remember all those times you call and say, hey, Paul, would you like to do a part in a play? <laughs> I know, but none of them had snakes in them. I know. That's why it's so great. <gasps> okay, Jules, how about this? $250. Nope. If, if people 500 I will do this, but it's got to be $500 that we earn tonight. And Ian is keeping track at the computer, on your comment thread, and on the Thunder Ticks uh, donation page. 500, Phyllis. Okay, tell them the rules. Uh, the rules? Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's enough people will donate just to see 
a, a snake draped off for you. But <gasps> what? Guess what? I already have a 20. What? I have a 20, a dollar donation from Brett. From Brett? My Brett? Brett? Et tu, Brette? Yep, you got to do what the people want. Yeah, but you don't have to be the people. Thank you, Brett, for your generous donation. And for anyone else, just comment here and then go straight to the link. There are other ways that you can donate to as well. If you want to sponsor a single month show, that's just $100 instead of the snake on me. And um, you'll appear in all of our social media and all of our shows. And if you want to be a 2021 season sponsor, you can do that for $500 for the entire season. And if you want to see Jules creeped out and covered by snakes. Ah, snake. K -k singular. Snake. One. If you want to see Jules draped over with a snake, just get together with some of your friends and chip in and put it in the comment section. If we get $100, she'll touch the snake. And for $250, she'll drape it. Yikes. Okay, so you have your check. Oh, no. Ian has just informed me over there that we have a matching challenge of $1,000. That means for every dollar that you give up to, a, um, a th it's going to be matched. So if you haven't donated yet, we just got a matching $1,000 pledge challenge. Thank you. But that goes for the donations. Does that count for the snake? Yes. I guess it counts for the snake. <laughs> so your money's going to go further tonight. Thank you for that donation, I think. But thank you. And that puts us to our halfway mark. If you all match that, don't, that pledge that we just got, that's going to get us two-thirds of the way there. And I know that we're going to make it. Um, and don't forget, Ian has put the link for donating in the comment thread. And he's following that comment thread. We'll give you the updates throughout this show to see how close we come to getting Jules to drape the snake. Drape that snake. Drape that snake. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. So, anyways, back to the show. Now, to help us celebrate tonight, we've got some special guests, including a special segment from Black and Appalachia, as well as, yes, we're so thrilled to have them, as well as uh, special guests from the past, like Dr. Hezekiah Hankel, uh, from Robert and Larkin and uh, Peggy Ford. We've got a great look at the Melungeon people of Appalachia from Wayne Winkler. And we'll also be visited by historical figures of the past with the Heritage Alliance's Angela Fellers Mason. We've also got some great music lined up too with Jesus, who will be performing remotely for us, as well as my good friend Ubunibia Fia Short, who's going to be coming here from, from, uh, from right in Johnson City. And before we get started with that, I do want to thank our new 2021 season sponsors, Sandy and Gary Degner, and our newest uh, season sponsor, Ray D. Olafer, and our show sponsors tonight, Sandy and Terry Countermine. Thank you so much. We really could not do this without your support. Now, what's really great tonight is we have some friends from right here in Johnson City, Phyllis, and if you will help escort them to the stage, we have two of the three original founders of Emoja of Johnson City, Carla Forney and Elmer Washington, and they're going to come and tell us a little bit about Emoja. So, Cast, welcome them to the stage with me, will you? We're so glad to have you all here tonight. So before we hear about all the amazing things that Emoja is doing today, um, Carla, why don't you share with us a little bit about how Emoja started, some of their history. What's their history? Thanks, Jewel. Thanks so much for inviting us. Uh, Emoja started in, uh, well, Unity started in the 19, late 1970s at Carver Recreation Center where a group of people from NAACP and from Concerned Citizens got together and on the 8th of August, annually, they had a picnic called the Unity Picnic. And that went on for several years, and then all of a sudden, it, it just stopped. And about middle 1990s, in Tennessee, all around, the uh, festivals were popping up everywhere. West Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, everywhere was a festival. And so a group of us got together and decided, we're going to try this. So little did we know how hard the work was, but, but we tried it. 
I was the first president for that group, and I was president for like six years, I think it was. And um, Six years you were president? Yeah. Wow. So, uh, but uh, we decided we wanted to keep the unity going. So uh, in, what was it? I forget. Two in 1997, uh, we started what we call Umoja. And it's so, it's, so uh, it's ironic that when it was a picnic, the name was Unity. With Umoja, the name was Unity. And Becky Hilbert, a lady that works from the, at the, worked at the City Hall, she named it. And Unity is a Swahili word. Umoja means unity in Swahili. So we started a festival. Uh, the reason for the festival was to bring everybody together in unity in Washington County and Johnson City. That was our purpose. Unity in, all in every way. So we set up, uh, we got money through donations from businesses and organizations and grants and anybody that would give us a dollar, we took it. Okay. So, Sounds uh, familiar. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm, yeah. So um, we had it at Carver Recreation Center. And we were there from 97 until 2006. Now you gotta remember that when we first started, one of the plans was so people could keep their kids in school clothes. So the vendors, we charged like $50 that allowed the community people to pay that and raise money for school clothes for kids. So that was one good thing. So then we started growing we had uh, entertainers come in, had stilt walkers that came in from, um, where did they come from? New Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. Wow. Uh, every year he came in from, brought his group from New Orleans. And then in 2006, we had set, it was a three day festival. We had set up everything, stage set, booth set up, uh, everything ready to go, and we had the flood. Oh, yeah. In Carver in that big field. So we had to move that festival in three days to Freedom Hall. So we moved the festival and we stayed at Freedom Hall till 2010, then we went downtown. But you, uh, is not only a festival, it's like we say, unity, bring everybody together. We worked, we did the Kwanzaa every year in December we had the Kwanzaa celebration, celebrating the seven principles of Kwanzaa, teaching Kwanzaa, teaching what those principles were, teaching the foods and all that. And then we worked also with the um, John City Board of Education to make sure that minorities got hired. And we would um, meet with them. They helped us to, uh, we helped them to get the information out about what was open and get kids in so they can make sure the applications were complete before they turned it in, whatever they had. So we worked with them regularly for a couple of years to make sure that minorities got hired. And then uh, it moved to downtown, and I'm going to let Mr. Washington do that. And that's where I remember, um, that's where I came in, is when you all were downtown, and the McKinney Center often goes downtown, and um, and participates in Emoja. It's one of my favorite events. So Elmer, tell me about the great things, tell me about the Emoja Festival this, these days and all the great things that you're doing now. Well, first of all, we hadn't totally decided about the Emoja Festival for this year because of COVID, but we are working on other things like we're planning on having some events with ETSU at the Murray Martin uh, Center this year and we are having uh, other activities that we're, once COVID is passed, we'll be able to make definite decisions. But right now uh, we're in the process of uh, just doing some planning. Great, and now if people want to get involved with Emoja or donate to Emoja or find out more, where should they go to find out? Uh, our president is Joe Bradley and his wife is Angelita. That is our new uh, leadership for this year. And you can, the Umoja JC.com. Umoja JC. <laughs> 
www.emojiradio.com. Thank you so much for coming out tonight and sharing with us about Emoja. Thank we you. appreciate y'all so much. Thank you for inviting Thank you. And thanks for what you do. Jules, it looks like one of our guests has arrived now. I'm glad they got my post I uh, put online about social distancing and arriving at staggering times. Yes, thank you, Phyllis, for making sure that our historical and dead figures <laughs> from the past are social distancing and keeping safe. I know they appreciate it. Well, just remember, if you're historical like me or not, <laughs> wear a mask so you can keep making history. My name is Dr. Hezekiah B. Hankel. I was born in 1825 in Free Hill, Tennessee, near where you folks call Gray, Tennessee today. I was born a slave and was reared in the home by the Hankels, a Dutch family. As a child, I learned to speak both English and Dutch fluently. I am proud to be one of the founding fathers of Johnson City you might wonder how that happened. Considering my first 40 years were those during which slavery was legal and acknowledged by a vast majority, though there is nothing normal, just as immoral about the practice of one human owning another and having the right to sell another human or their child or spouse. Perhaps this is a discussion for another time. Since August 20th, 1619, when the first enslaved humans from Angola kidnapped by Portuguese mar marauders and brought to Jamestown, Virginia to be sold to, James, to English colonists to work on their tobacco plantation. There hasn't arisen yet the right time for this discussion. 402 years ago, Perhaps time will yield a moment for this discussion for, before another four centuries pass. Those first people from Angola knew what freedom felt like. And then 246 years later, 10 generations later, my generation would also know what freedom felt like. But perhaps not as deeply as my ancestors for well, they came from a country and a place where the ruling body and leadership and culture were one of their own. I was technically free, but not free from the laws. Created in a charter, which has forever cast us as strangers in a strange land, and not founders, pioneers, colonists, as my European counterparts. In 1619, those same European counterparts were scraping to survive. The first permanent English settlement was in this same place, Jamestown, and had only been there 12 years. They were not native to the land. They were fighting for survival, and that colony almost disappeared after the starving time of 1610. My ancestors, are not footnotes in the making of the country. We didn't arrive after the country was established. That is a myth worth examining. No, we were part of the establishment of this country from its earliest beginnings. And yet, and yet, education is, it is so important for everyone Within education, you can understand how to heal your body and your mind and your spirit and heal those around you. Within education, freedom is made much more accessible. Freedom for all the slaves in Tennessee came on October 24, 1864. I was 40, and I foresaw three needs of a newly freed people starting with education. And with education came up the other two, medical care and spiritual needs. And to continue to remain inaccessible to too many people today. But in my place, 
And in my time, I worked to address these needs where I could first at home of my making and then in the new community I helped establish. In my 40th year of freedom, I determined I was free enough to live a life of my choosing. I married Mariah Netherland. We bought a home in Johnson City and raised 10 beautiful children using the Bible as the foundation of all of our learning and relationships. In 1866, I was 41. The Boone's Creek Christian Church ordained me as a minister. Later, I went on to help establish four other black churches here in Washington County. I baptized over 400 people, many who was formerly enslaved. In a one-room log cabin on Roan Hill, I started a school for African Americans known as the Roan School. In 1873, when I was 48, I received an official teaching certificate from the state of Tennessee. In the middle of my life, I was also beginning my life. I used my degree to train future teachers who were also beginning their lives and ready to train the next generation, the 12th generation since 1619. By 1888, more and more formerly enslaved people were seeking education and there was a need for more schools. Professor Wolf, the school principal, and I pushed for a school building in Johnson City. Our request was simple. One teacher and a textbook and a building. In just one year, our student population grew exponentially. Students were meeting in three different Johnson City churches and in the Odd Fellows Building. The primary and intermediate grades were added and another full-time teacher was hired. Dear kind Miss Carson allowed the high school student to meet in a room in her Johnson City home. In the fall of 1893, I, along with Daniel Reeves and Alfred Hyder, established a new high school on the corner of Myrtle Avenue and Elm Street. We named it Langston Normal School. After John Langston, who was a black legislator from Virginia, the first black man to hold public office, we wanted our students to know they could inspire to leadership especially if they saw someone like themselves in those leadership positions. In the spring of 1897, the first class of Langston Normal School celebrated its graduation. There were two class members, one being my very own daughter, Julia. I am proud to share that Julia later returned to Langston as a teacher. Langston Normal School educated black students for seven decades. The final class graduated in 1965 when integration finally came to Johnson City Schools. Today, the Langston Center stands as a monument to the education of people of color in our area and continues to be a place of community education with its rededication and programming aimed toward civic engagement classes, lectures, and workshops. During this time, I also a practicing physician. I taught school during the week. I studied and practiced medicine on Saturdays until I became a full-time medical doctor. My medical practice served the black Cherokee Dutch population, but suddenly in 1873, Things changed. Exer, Exer. The cholera epidemic struck East Tennessee. The cholera epidemic struck Washington County. Doctors of white patients began to notice that while their patients were dying from cholera, my husband's patients were surviving. 
This brought his medical skills into prominence, and the doctors started sharing knowledge and practices. The medical field here was essentially integrated because of this. An interracial medical practice was a life-saving byproduct of this horrible epidemic. My interracial medical practice continued the rest of my life, continuing to learn even after you earn a degree in medicine or teaching or anything else is essential for growth. The doctors and I were committed to learning and growing together. Education is so important. My education also allowed me to see clearly that in order for real change to happen, to have equ equ equity and equality for those of us who were formerly enslaved and for our children to come, that we must represent, have representation in leadership. Exer, Exer, the first black man is elect in Johnson City, the board of Alderman. I ran and I was elected to the Johnson City Board of Aldermen in 1887, the first black man to serve in this capacity. After being a preacher, a teacher, and a doctor, I was now a politician, working to build a more equitable future. We accomplished much together. In those years, and yet, and yet, it has now been 18 generations since the first African descendants were brought to the shores of Jamestown in English occupied North America in 1623. 18 generations. How long have your descendants been here? Or yours? Are they still fighting for equality too? 18 generations. Black American history is American history. Thank you, Dr. Hezekiah Hankel. What a story. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Storytown Radio Show on WETS 89.5 FM out of Johnson City, Tennessee. Thank you, Brett, for playing that fabulous break music. Um, and we are back. And we have an incredibly exciting music guest this month. Usually they'd be setting up here, but because of COVID, our music guest has done something really super for us. For the very first time, we're having on our show Jeremy Ray, better known as Jesus. He is a, an American and Tennessee hip-hop recording artist and producer born in Rocky Top, Tennessee. Let's hear it for him. And he is joining us remotely tonight in a private concert just for Storytown. Uh-uh, 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 yeah, uh-huh, uh-uh, okay, yeah. Couple things I wanna say, this is the only way this right here is titled Chamber Music. <laughs> All right, here we, here we go now. Uh, here we go now. Yeah, structurally, I'm tough as a beast. Why would I even play if it wasn't for keeps? Now I'm stuck in this place, the luck of disgrace. Digging trenches, no need to mention the mud on my face. But it's all for the cause, the barking this dog is typically the one will hop off the log. When it's time to ride, obedient being, I'm really not that type of guy. Instead of swiping, no swiping, we let the swiper swipe. Bow our heads, let us pray that you'll show the signs. So divine in its prime, if you know the mind. Hell is perception of reality, now shows the times. Brutality of every kind is the dotted line. Do right by Mother Nature and respect Father Time. Decent humanity, damn it, it seems hard to find. Scramble and manage and never to be unoccupied. The marathon will continue with Michael Johnson's stride. The marathon will continue with Michael Johnson's stride. Uh 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 yeah. Uh huh. Please tell me where the concubines. 
In the dark, close your eyes, I ain't hard to find. Yeah, is it time? Uh, the night as crisp and clouds cover up the stars. These the ones I spend getting it up to par. Dumb it down, can't do it, only up the bar. We was wildin' in the woods, got a ton of scars. Once a seed planted loosely in the dirt. Up came a flower, a groove in every curve To tell me that this isn't you will prove to be absurd Take a long look in the mirror, you can't be discouraged I can do it your way, but then I lose me Catch me in the clutch, stick shift or two, three Now let the snare roll like six kicks from Bruce Lee So you can nod your head or maybe move your feet but to each his own as I stroll with pride I might drown in the sky the way I hold it high Rolling down the river until I feel we run them dry Evolutionary thinking, we're so deprived Evolutionary, revolutionary, hey Please tell me where the concubines In the dark, close your eyes, I ain't hard to find yeah, is it time? And right into the next. What's happening, folks? Glad you're here. My name is Jesus, and this next tune is titled Sweepy. Uh-huh. Yeah, take the culture back, bust through, show the pads. Pull up the ring, what's it mean to know what's next? Rolling up a green stick like Yoda has. Playing Boulder Dash, eating on a bowl of smacks. Stomping for a while now, yeah, I know the land. Hamberland saving less than crushed soda cans. Optimistic even with the weak poker hand. Focused in, potent spit, doing it with a joke of grin. The people's champ, chilling with an evil tramp. Debating if I'll make it over this evil Knievel ramp. I'll be leaving and coming back, need a stamp. As a youngin' with these raw bars, knew I'd be the man. No receipt in hand for my life, I'll keep it then. Eating weak raps like weak raps, keeping thin. Fat kick with a snare, all I need to jam. Flash, plenty laxative in Peter Pan. Fly, plenty laxative in Peter Pan. Uh-huh. Okay, 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 okay. This next cut right here is titled Muse. It's titled Muse, my guys, because every now and then I have things that inspire me. Or is that every time? I think it is, and this is what I do consider this to be my audio diary. Uh, working a nine to five to make sure that I provide. Pacing side to side, time to slide, ride or die. I'm turning all of this water into the finest wine. For my sons and my daughter, harder I gotta grind. Minute after minute, chiseling up off the clock. When I feel that I'm winning, really I'm often not. Put me on the spot, feeling like a polka dot. I've been all in, gambling here for the pot. Again and again, rambling as the pin jots. The world's my interstate, handling's just a parking lot. Hard to dodge the barrage, no camouflage. Ammo wise collected, never neglect to handle mine. Hammer time MC, candlelight is the only way to lay the foundation of all against me. Convincing, no pretending, hopeless endings. My favorite color is purple. Shout out to Oprah Winfrey. Let's see, always been the same, yet a different dude. Could have been out here clucking up under Devo's pigeon coop. In the mirror isn't you, that's why I don't abide by. Anything you say, think or feel, I only mind mine. I'm just trying to alter a bit of your timeline Instead of chiseling down, I'm here to make minds wide Climb high, and if you fall, it just means it's time to fly Be careful as you navigate, because we kinda high Uh, be careful as you navigate, because we kinda high the Captain come on, and he's saying, he's like be careful as you navigate, because we're kinda hard We're kinda hard, yet the skull <laughs> oh wow. This is your captain speaking, and now the um controls are tweaking, and now I gotta put my parachute on. It sucks for you, and now I gotta go. Here's to you, and I'm out. Peace. I've got one more for you guys, and uh, this one is the first of many on the project The Wailing. I titled this Jogging Night. Uh, any music outlet you can find any of this stuff there so The Wailing by Jesus yeah 
How you doing? The name is Jesus. Not the same character that everybody praises. Maybe one day we'll meet our maker. But until that is the case, I ain't with the waiting. Spaces just beyond the clouds. Now I'm gazing, blazing on occasion while on the great ship. Trying to make sense of this place here, but can't dang it. Am I knocking all this grace? Cause I'm a thinker. Can't just be around if you ain't on the same. Dangerous is the grounds that we all play in. Trade it for not a thing, cause it's so amazing. Taking this elixir on the sugar saving. Patience is a virtue worth the you may day. Say, man, this the jam, let it play, baby. Baby, kid, since a young and running pavement. They said that I was mean, call me little pinky. Shoot sinking in the sand, was it tug to your chances? Everybody wanna shoot, but won't practice the aiming. Can I get an amen? Critique by the layman. Peace by the same man, speech highly blatant And I see straight through these obstacles On this cliff with clarity Rudy hugs the ball, giving to you sparingly Let me touch your soul, Robert Kelly bars Here make room for the golden flow What goes around comes around now, do -si do Watch the way they flake, crumble in like toasty doughs Hundred miles and running for the fun, gave me toasty toast Still hard-headed as I was with a crusty nose Faith in me the way the Catholics trust in the Pope Everybody wanting heaven but they not rushing to go Before you hanging by a thread start adjusting the rope My perspective's all I need ain't no fussing with folk No Yeah I said I said I said I said I said my perspective's all that I need My perspective's all I need so let me be Peace <laughs> And uh I'd like to thank Storytown for having me, telling a few stories of my own from the album The Wailing. So again, if this is something that interests you, uh, this East Tennessee hip hop, boom bap style type stuff, then uh, you can find it. So you guys be easy, have a good night. Wash your hands. What comes to mind is our youth. Because now all of us have the patient day, celebrating our family, interrogating the TV channel. What really matters is what America will follow him on Instagram. Welcome to Storytown. Let's just take a listen and you'll be spellbound. We gather all your stories in a brand new day. Oh, no. $160. And I want to especially thank out there Faye Webb, Teresa Hammond, Sandra Fisher, Deborah Lowry. Lowry. Thank you so much. And Deborah and Teresa, how could you? 340 more, and she's going to drape that snake. Oh, no. Yeah. And just the, the things I'm willing to do for this group. Oh, my goodness. We do have that $1,000 match. So just remember, if you haven't donated yet, every dollar counts. Every dollar is going to get matched up to $1,000. And we want to thank our, our anonymous um, donor for doing that. So if you haven't yet and, and you've thought about it, tonight's the night to do it because they're matching up to 1000 So thank you for that. Blech. Even if it means I'm going to... Did y'all see what Katie did? I think Katie seems to think y'all are going to come through because it's me surrounded by snakes. Yeah, that's what I say, Jared. Take it away. <laughs> and you don't have to be so happy about it. Yes, Phyllis, do you have an update? No, I just... Uh, I, I want to tell you that it's just my pleasure to give you these updates. Thank you. You just don't have to be so happy about it. Now, coming up is something that we all want to see, though, not me draped in a snake. And it's Angela Fellers Mason with a, another installment of Ask, Ask the, the Historian. Historian. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, Phyllis. And, Phyllis, here's a little something for the whole apre of the snake snay. I'm fluent in gibberish, Anne. I got it, Ann. Oh, Ann, I have more to add to the tally. Okay, Ann, take it away. In April of 1820, Elihu Embry published his paper, The Emancipator. It was the first publication dedicated solely to the cause of abolitionism, and it was published right here on Main Street in Jacob Howard's print shop. Embry was a Quaker, and he belonged to the Tennessee Society for Promoting the Manumission of Slaves, or the Manumission Society for short. 
He wrote the memorials for the society that were presented to the Tennessee State Legislature in 1817. His newspaper only had seven editions from April, April until October of 1820 because in December of that year, he died. And we imagine he was too ill to edit the November paper. Still, even though it only lasted for less than a year, Embry's paper had subscribers in Boston and Philadelphia, and in June of 1820, he had to print more than 2,500 copies. That is important to know, but this isn't Embry's story. No, you're right. This isn't his story. This is your story, Nancy. This is my story, and I'm going to share it with you as much as I can. I don't remember all the details, not anymore, but when they come back to me, they come back in pieces. I don't remember where or when I was born. I was enslaved by Elihu Embry. Many people don't know the mind behind the Emancipator also owned an enslaved people, but he did. I was not the only one. Mr. Embry owned enslaved people before he started his paper. He told me he was a deist for a long time, that he didn't hold true to his Quaker beliefs. Quakers, they were animate about abolition. Elizabeth Worley Carriger, she was Mr. Embry's second wife, and she owned enslaved people from her first marriage. Back then, when a woman got married, her property became someone else's, and Mr. Embry, he became, an ensla he became an enslaver. He even brought other enslaved people after they were married. I think that's when he brought me, my husband Richard, and our child. But in 1809, Mr. Embry was in trouble with his shipping business, so he sold my family to his creditor to pay his debt. He explained years later that he did his best to keep us all together. Well, what led Embry the Enslaver to become Embry the Abolitionist? When Mr. Embry had a reawakening in his Quaker faith, he manumitted his enslaved people in 1812. But a funny thing happened. My family, we came back to Mr. Embry. I can't remember why or how, but he owned us again. It, it was different, though. We were enslaved, but Mr. Emery didn't ask us to work without compensation. He even set aside land for us to farm. My Richard died. I had five children, but Mr. Emery, he looked after their education. I remember when Mr. Emery was ready to start his newspaper, it was a lot of work, and it took a lot of money. Mr. Emery's brother, Elijah, would fuss with him because he was using all of his money for the paper and not putting it into the family business at the Emory Iron Mine and Furnace. But Mr. Emory, he was determined to publish the paper. He saw it as the culmination of his life's work and he managed to pull it off. The first edition was published April 30th, 1820. Exer, Exer. The new paper is started in Jonesboro. This paper, The Emancipator, is especially designed by the editor, myself, Elihu Embry, to advocate the abolition of slavery and to be a repository of tracts on that interesting and important subject. It will contain all the necessary information that the editor can obtain of the progress of the abolition of the slavery of the descendants of Africa together with a concise history of their introduction into slavery, collected from the best authorities. Although the editor is far from being a man of leisure, as any in his acquaintance, and not the owner of the office where this paper will be printed, and therefore shall have to hire the printing of it. And although he has spent several thousand dollars already in some small degree abolishing and endeavoring to facilitate the general abolition of slavery, that he feels not satisfied without still continuing to throw in his might, hoping that if the weight of it should not at present be felt, that when the scale comes nearly to a preponderancy, it will more sensibly be perceived 
in some small degree hasten an even balance of equal rights to the now neglected sons and daughters of Africa. Mr. Emery was very proud of his paper. But what about you? How did you feel? You were enslaved by him while he was writing these words. Yes, I was. I was conflicted and I was hurt. Even though he treated us like we were free, we weren't free. We were property. Mr. Emery, Emery felt conflicted too. Well, did he ever talk about that in his paper? Once, in response to a letter he received. Dear friend, I think it is my duty to inform you of a report that is in circulation about you in this part. It is said by Mr. J near this place that he is well acquainted with you, that you once owned a number of slaves and that you sold them all. Now, sir, though I never saw you nor had any acquaintance with your character, I do not believe this report for I know you are engaged in a work which exposes you to censor, culminy, and implacable hatred. But there are some, no doubt, who feed on this report as with, as with much pleasure as a buzzard would on carrion. Signed, GM. Friend, GM, and others whom it may concern, in answer to the above, I will just observe that, to my shame, be it said, I have owned slaves. To my shame, be it also said, I have denied for years the truth of the Christian religion. And during these years, I have become possessed of slaves. In his response, Mr. Embry talked about the family he, so he sold to keep together and then brought back. He says that since he bought them back, he has never asked them to work without pay. Well, what else did Embry say in his response? He says the enslaved people he has, he can't free them at present because of money. Tennessee state law made manumission expensive. Part of that was so newly manumitted people wouldn't be left destitute. The bigger part of it was to make manumission unattractive to enslavers. Also, you weren't legally allowed to manumit the children and not their mother. This is the true history of all my dealing in slaves, by which I have lost in cash not less than $4,000. Not so much on account of the loss as on account of the deviation from rectitude. I repent that I ever owned one. But in as much as I have not set up even the best part of my life as a criterion, it is to be hoped that the worst acts of the worst part of it cannot be applied in such a way as to render even doubtful this self-evident truth that all men are created equally free and independent and are entitled to their liberty whatever may be the mis misconduct of others well what about you and your children after mr embry died his will was read in Washington County Courthouse on January 16, 1821. In his will, he stated, My faithful servant and slave, Black Nancy, together with her children, frames a yellow boy or young man, Abigail and Sophia, two black daughters, and Moriah, her yellow daughter, and John, her son, nearly black, should be legally emancipated as soon as the loan which the estate of Godfrey Carriger, deceased, has on him, them can be extinguished. Mr. Embry didn't own us outright, and that complicated matters for everyone. In his will, he asked his brother Elijah to sell whatever property he could to pay the loan off so we could be free. He provided land for us to live on at Elijah's property, and he set aside a portion of his estate to help educate my children. How unjust that someone else's money woes could keep you from being free. <laughs> Nothing about slavery was just. Was the loan paid off? Were you truly freed in 1821? I don't remember, but 
I hope we were. <sighs> what happened to you and your children? Find out. Search for those pieces where you can and put them together. Why did Mr. Embry keep us? Did he really pay us for our work, even though we bore the mantle of enslavement? What was the nature of our relationship? Why was it so important that the color of my children be described in the will? I don't think I'll find the answers to all those questions. <laughs> you won't. But where you are now is a start. You know I existed. You know I have a story. Now go and find what you can. Maybe someday we'll both be back here with more to say. I hope so. And thank you to Nancy and thank you Anne and the Heritage Alliance for preserving and exploring these voices that would otherwise be lost to the past. Well, speaking of voices, I want to introduce you to one of my favorite voices in this region. Now, you may have seen her in last year's production of The Little Mermaid at Johnson City Community Theater, and it ended up getting a shout out from broadwayworld.com when she played the role of Ursula. We have our friend, the very talented Ubunibi Afia Short and Brett McCluskey on piano. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me, yeah. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, and I'm feeling good. Fish in the sea, you know how I feel. River running free, you know how I feel. Blossom on a tree, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Dragon flying out in the sun, you know what I mean, don't you know? Butterflies all having fun, you know what I mean. Sleep in peace when day is done, that's what I mean. And this old world is a new world and a bold world for me. Stars, when you shine, you know how I feel. Scent of the pine, you know how I feel. Oh, freedom is mine, and I know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. For Thank you so much, Ubunibi Afia. <laughs> I told you, what a voice. I can't wait until theater returns, just so that I can see you do the thing that you love so much, is be on stage again. 
Well, we are also lucky to have another friend with us tonight. You may recognize him as the voice on your drive to work on WETS 89.5 FM, while others of you might know him as our wonderful editor. Wayne Winkler is also an author, and I just saw him on C-SPAN a couple of weeks ago talking about his recent book, and we're so glad to have him as a guest on this show, which is a first, because usually he's the man behind the editing tools. Wayne Winkler, everybody. Thank you. Back in the early 1960s, when I was in grade school, one of the generally accepted polite terms for African Americans was colored people. My little brother, who was about five years old, heard someone use that term and he said, we're all colored people or you wouldn't be able to see us. In those days, my brother and I didn't give a lot of thought to what colored people were. In our neighborhood in Detroit, in our school, everyone was some shade of brown or tan, some lighter, some darker. Even in my own family, everyone was a different color. That's just the way it was and we didn't think much about it. But before long, we realized that other people did think about color and they often treated people differently depending on what color they were. My dad came from Hancock County, Tennessee, and there people called our family Melungeons. No one knows where that word came from or what it originally meant, but everyone knew that it meant something bad, and no one wanted to be called a Melungeon. The Melungeons were a mixed race group first documented in the Clinch River region of Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia at the beginning of the 19th century. The first known use of the word Melungeon in print came from right here in Jonesboro. William Brownlow ran a newspaper called the Jonesboro Whig, and in 1840, in 1840, he supported the Whig candidate for president, William Henry Harrison, a hero of the War of 1812. General Leslie Combs came to East Tennessee to campaign for Harrison, and Brownlow reported the documents. The Democrats tried to get the general to debate with, I quote, an impudent melungeon, a scoundrel, who is half Negro and half Indian. He had more to say about that impudent melungeon for the next few issues of the paper, none of it complimentary. Over the years, a lot of people have suggested possible origins of the Melungeons, and there's still some debate about it. But most of the serious research indicates that Brownlow was more or less correct, at least about the ancestry of the Melungeons. The Melungeons are a mixture of European, African, and Native American ancestry. There were lots of similar communities of mixed people all over the southeastern United States. Melungeon was what they were called in Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. In other places, members of such communities were called by other names. Redbones, Croatans, Brass Ankles, Issues, We Sortas, Ramps, Jacksons, Whites, they all pretty much kept to themselves and tried to avoid the worst of the prejudice they faced. William Brownlow was indirectly involved with the Melungeons again in 1845. The original Tennessee Constitution from 1796 granted the vote to all free men. The revised Constitution of 1834 restricted the vote to free white men. In 1845, William Brownlow was the Whig candidate for the House of Representatives from Tennessee's 1st District, running against the incumbent Democrat Congressman Andrew Johnson. It was a bitter, hard-fought campaign, which Johnson won by 1,000 votes. After the election, eight Melungeon men were charged with illegal voting by reason of color. A couple of men avoided the trial by paying a fine. The others went to court, where they were defended by attorney John Netherland of Rogersville. Netherland argued that the Melungeons were not descended from Africans, but were the descendants of Portuguese explorers who came to America at some unknown date. Netherland didn't cite any sources for this information, nor did he mention that Portugal had been occupied by the Moors for four centuries, and the Moors were definitely from Africa. 
But it worked. The men were acquitted, and the legend of the Melungeon's Portuguese ancestry was begun. Thirty years later, a lawyer in Chattanooga used the same argument to win an inheritance case. Years after that trial, he acknowledged that this was a convenient way to explain the dark skin of the Melungeons. He said, and I quote, our southern high-bred people will never tolerate on equal terms any person who is even remotely tainted with Negro blood, but they do not make the same objection to other brown or dark-skinned people, like the Spanish, the Cubans, the Italians, etc. Now, it's important to point out that these claims of Portuguese ancestry were originally made on behalf of the Melungeons rather than by the Melungeons themselves. Still, in a society that practiced severe discrimination against African Americans, there was a distinct advantage in having white people believing a romantic myth about the racial ancestry of the Melungeons. The Melungeons weren't the only people doing this. Light and dark-skinned individuals of partial African heritage often identified themselves as Portuguese to hide or disguise their true racial identity in an oppressive social climate where skin color essentially determined one's legal status. That legal status was seriously undermined during the 20th century when many states passed laws intended to protect the so-called purity of white race. The most far-reaching of those laws was the 1924 Racial Integrity Act passed by Virginia. That law divided the people of the Commonwealth into two categories, white and colored. White people enjoyed all the rights and the privileges offered to citizens of the Commonwealth as long as they had no trace of ancestry other than Caucasian. Colored people were those with any trace of ancestry other than white, including African or Native American. Enforcement of the Racial Integrity Act was the responsibility of the Virginia Registrar of Vital Statistics, Dr. Walter Plecker. Even people with light skin weren't safe, since Plecker had access to the records that allowed him to discover any non-white people lurking deep in someone's ancestry. Because of Plecker's work, kids were abruptly because of Plecker's work, kids were abruptly withdrawn from white schools and placed in colored schools. Patients were removed from white hospitals. Bodies were even removed from white cemeteries if the state had reason to believe that the deceased was not 100% Caucasian. And Plecker sent to county clerks list of family names belonging to people he suspected were not purely white. These county clerks were instructed to refuse to issue marriage licenses when one of the parties was white and the other was from a family on Plecker's list. Many states adopted similar laws, but Virginia was so efficient in uncovering non-white ancestry that Nazi Germany sent representatives to learn Plecker's techniques. They applied those techniques to discover Jewish ancestry in German citizens. Walter Plecker died in 1946, but the Racial Integrity Act he helped to write stayed in effect until 1967, when it was finally struck down by the United States Supreme Court. Faced with unrelenting legal and social discrimination, Melungeons and members of other mixed groups around the South often moved to industrial cities up north where no one knew or cared about their mixed heritage. By the 1960s, most of these groups had virtually disappeared. But at the end of the 1960s, a funny thing happened. Community leaders in poverty-stricken Hancock County, Tennessee, decided to capitalize on the story of the Melungeons to attract tourists to an outdoor drama. From 1969 to 1976, Visitors from all over the country attended the outdoor drama Walk Toward the Sunset. In the end, the drama failed to attract the tourists the county leaders had hoped for. But in the process, people with Melungeon ancestry began to acknowledge their heritage and to celebrate it. Hancock County, which had once been embarrassed by its Melungeon citizens, now proudly proclaimed the county to be the home of the Melungeons. Today, many people use DNA technology as a tool for genealogy, to find out who their ancestors were. And many people are discovering that they have ancestry in all parts of the world. Lots of folks who consider themselves entirely white are learning that they have ancestors that came from Asia, the Middle East, or Africa. And multiracial Americans have become the fastest growing demographic group. 
So the Melungeons weren't some isolated throwback. We were the wave of the future. Walter Plecker must be turning over in his grave. My little brother was right. We're all colored people. We come in a rainbow of colors, and we're all kin. It's time we started acting like it. Amen to that. <laughs> Wayne, you've uncovered so much history here, and it's your own history. I, I love that this is connected to your own story. And you've got some books out on this subject, right? That's, that's right, I do. A Walk Toward the Sunset is an overall history of the Melungeons and similar groups. Beyond the Sunset examines the creation of the Melungeon outdoor drama. And both books are published by Mercer University Press and are available on Amazon or at local bookstores. Be sure to read more and get those books. Thanks so much, Wayne, for coming out tonight. Jules, Jules, we did it. I've got an update. What? On a snake tally. It looks like we've got the $505. Drape the snake, Jules. To, do you do you might do you maybe have some names of people who uh no we'll 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 can I'll thank you personally later, all of you people who contributed. Thank you. No, really, thank you. Thank you for supporting this show, even though it means I'm going to get draped by the snake. And, and Jules, we'll be seen, sending everyone the link uh, when you're going to do your interview so that they'll be sure to see you with the snake and the snake lady. I guess we're going to move on to our next story now then. Thank you so much, Phyllis. Uh, here, is, here is another story, though, and, and this is... This is one of the most remarkable stories that I came across when I was just going through some court cases, some old court cases, and one was put in my hand by um, Deborah Montanti. Uh, Great. So Deborah Montanti put this this court case in my hand. The the transcripts. It, it, it's it was really a, a, a an amazing case, and um, and this is the story of it, and. Um, you might not have known about it, but it is a Jonesboro landmark case that took place, a landmark case in the whole country. But I'm going to let history speak for itself. Please welcome to the stage and from the past, Larkin, Robert, and Peg, and Rhoda Ford in the case of Ford versus Ford. And we're going to start at the Hales family with this. I said, open the door, Hale, before I open it and myself and break it down. Lloyd Ford, you, have you lost your senses? It's 2.30 in the morning and you're shouting at my door and using language unfit for my wife to bear. I don't care. You know what I'm here for. Now open the door. You're drunk and I don't know why you're here. Lower your voice, calm down. I won't open the door until you do. Fine, fine. Just open the door now. Get in there, old man. Good heavens, Lloyd, watch how you treat your father. Tell them to get it, now. He's talking about the will, Robert. What will? It's no good, Robert. He knows about the will. You better get it before someone gets hurt. No, I won't get it. It's your last will and testament, not his. You haven't seen his face in more than a decade. He never once came to help you on the farm since he moved away. Not him nor his brothers. How you decide to leave the property is up to you. As far as I'm concerned, they gave up their claim when they went their own selfish ways. Well, that's just it, isn't it? See, you're not concerned. This is about our family, and we'll handle our own matters. You haven't handled your family matters since you left here, barely a man. What makes you think you can come here now and take what isn't yours? This rifle gives me the right. Now get the papers. I guess you're going to have to decide which one of us you'll use it on first, because believe me, You'll get one chance, and when you aim in that direction, one of us will get you from the other. Yeah? Well, one of you will be dead. Which one do you think you'll be? Robert, wait. We'll give him what he wants. Nobody needs to get hurt. Finally, I'm dealing with someone who understands. I don't understand what you're doing, but I do understand that you're drunk and that you have a bad temper. Here. Good. Throw them in the fire. Burn them all. Maybe that will satisfy him. Sarah, don't. Don't give him the satisfaction. I'm sorry, Robert. It's for the best for all of us. Lloyd, 
Now please go. It's very late and your father's very old. He shouldn't even be out in the night air. He'll catch his death. I can only hope. All right, leave my house now. Sarah, why'd you give in and burn the papers? We swore an oath that we'd keep those papers safe. We kept our oath. I burned an old school essay, not the will. Lloyd Jr. looked right at it when you threw it in the flames. He can't read. He doesn't know what I burned. I only hope we're able to keep his secret. I do too, but where are the real papers? I hid them. It's better that I don't tell you. Then if you're ever asked at a later time, you can answer truthfully that you don't know where they are. Order in the court. I ask you, Mr. Robert Hale, do you know what became of the will? No, sir. I can honestly, honestly say I do not know where the will was until my wife presented it to the courts after Mr. Lloyd Ford Sr.'s death. That was the beginning. The court case of Floyd versus Flo Ford versus Ford. The year was 1843. A few months before this date, I was property. Counted with the acreage and head of cattle that was owned by Lloyd Ford Sr. of Jonesboro, Tennessee. I was also his property, but only until he died. After his death, I wasn't conveyed to his relatives along with his land and his other belongings, as was customary practice since the founding of this country. Usually, I would be passed down to an heir. Usually, I would continue my work until I died, not my owner. Usually, that's how it worked. This time, it didn't. It was unusual and became a landmark case regarding slaves and land ownership. When my brothers and I were granted our freedom and property by our former master. And father. And possible father. He called us his children in his will and with his good friends. A father does not own his children. He worked us the same as any other slave. He treated us well. He treated us better than the other masters treated their slave. He treated us better than he treated his own children. That is true. And we treated him better than his own children treated him. And that is exactly why we are here. The last will and testament of Lloyd Ford Sr. clearly states that the estate will go to his children. Exactly. And I'm his child. His black children. This is outrageous. They were outraged, all right. In no other place had something like this happened. Some masters had set their slaves free in their will. This was beyond that. We were set free. We were acknowledged as its children. We were granted land and property. All of this took place while there were relatives, white relatives, non-slave relatives, alive and angry and left out. Well, not completely left out. I apologize for my outburst, Your Honor, but how would you feel if the only thing you inherited was one acre of land and everything else went to those, those people? They're not people. They are slaves, property, mine by all rights. I believe, sir, that this trial will decide that. By law, we, as people of color, were not allowed to bring a civil suit of our case and to defend our right to remain on this land after freedom. We needed to find a white person to stand in the role of next friend to file suit for us. Finding someone to do this was not easy. But we were lucky. There were people here who believed in sovereignty for all. We found someone who... Who will stand as the next friend for this case? I will, Your Honor. State your name for the court. My name is Phoebe Stewart, Your Honor. Mrs. Stewart, am I to believe that you are close friends with the former slaves who are bringing to suit this case? No, sir. Do you, or your, do you or your husband owe any outstanding debts, Mrs. Stewart? I don't understand what that would have to do with anything. 
Perhaps you bring this case forward, not as their next friend, as is prescribed by law, but for your own financial gain. Perhaps you are doing this in order to receive payment from the inheritance. I bring this case, sir, not for my own personal gain, but for a purpose. I believe first that Mr. Ford did have the right to leave his property to his, his other children. I believe they have the right to own it. I believe they have the right to their freedom and that they have the right to live freely on the land that was left to them as any other free person. I bring this case because it is the right thing to do. We went to court to address two issues. One, mainly, the ownership rights to the property left by the deceased, Lloyd Ford Sr., to his natural-born black children. Secondly, our right to own and live on property within the limits of Washington County. We are here, Your Honor, to decide on the validity of this will. We will decide all three concerns during the course of this trial then. We will, however, begin with the will. Are you able to produce this will? Yes, Your Honor. The will was produced by the Hale family, and Mr. Hale testified. This is the will that was drawn up at my home by Mr. Lloyd Ford, Sr. Those are our signatures. We wrote out everything he dictated. This was in 1840. I remember it perfectly. I'm ready, Lloyd. Just tell me what you want me to what you want to say, and I'll write it down. You think I'm crazy doing this, don't you? I don't question your sanity. Maybe just your judgment. If you could help me understand. Well, you see, I want Peg and Edward and Rhoda and the whole family. I, I want them to have their freedom when I'm gone. And I want to know they're going to be all right. They've been taking care of me, and I want to take care of them. A lot of people free their slaves. But you're talking about making them your heirs, Lloyd, them, instead of your children. They are my children. Yeah, they've grown up with you on the plantation. They are my children. Peg, Rhoda, Edward, Lark, John. They're my children, Robert. You can deny it, but my other children can deny it, but I won't deny them. But what about your other children? What about them? Do you see them? Are they here? Have they been here these last 20 years? Have they been caring for the state? Have they done one thing to deserve any of it? I've asked them each to come back, to visit, to help. They don't even respond, no. But my other children are at home on the plantation. I want to make it so they can remain on that land after I'm gone, but free. Is this, is this vengeance against your boys, Lloyd? No, no, no my, my other sons get some, Robert, some, not at all. They get what I believe they deserve. This last bout of sickness, I didn't think I'd make it. I sent for help. No one from my real family came, but my other family did. Peg, she came with a cool cloth from my head and a tea made from roots. Terrible smelling stuff, and she begged me to drink it. I didn't want to until she held my face in her hands and pleaded with me that it would draw the fever out. And when I looked into her eyes, I was looking into my own eyes. I never noticed before how much of me there was in her. Then Edward came to sing some kind of prayer song. There I was again. Before this, I never thought, or I guess wanted to think, I brought to life two sets of children those who would spend their lives free to do as they please, and children who would spend their lives imprisoned, whose children would spend their lives imprisoned, and so on. Is this going to be my legacy? There's an equal amount of me in each one of them. One is a legacy of ability and choice. One is a leg legacy of servitude. How can this be fair? They are all part of me. Would any part of me want to be in prison forever? Sarah, please get the paper. I'm ready. <coughs> in the name of God, amen, I, Lloyd Ford, Sr., of the state of Tennessee, Washington County, 
being of sound mind and good health and memory, want all my estate to be sold and the amount arising therefrom to be equally divided by my seven sons, James, Grantus, Alexander, William, Enoch, Thomas, and Benjamin. And I want my land and Negroes to be disposed of in the following manner. I want my son Lloyd to have one acre to live upon during his natural life. One? Only one. Have you done anything to deserve more except be born of my blood? One acre to live upon, live upon during your natural life. And I want my slaves to have their freedom and to have the land to live on and raise their families on as they see fit if they say fit to stay on the plantation. If they see fit to leave, I want that sold and equally divided between my sons. Do you have that all down, Sarah? Yes, I do. Lloyd, I'm starting to understand now, but just one more question, if you'll let me. Why not free them now? <sighs> I need them. I'm still one man, not an army. I can only do a small thing, and this is all I have the courage and strength to do. But I will need your help to make it happen, because I know there will likely be a fight. Please tell me you will guard and honor this will when the time comes. With our lives, Lloyd. The document is fake. I watched them burn the original two years ago. Is this true? No, sir. I admit that one night in October two years ago, Lloyd Ford Jr. came to my home intoxicated with a rifle and demanded the will or he would shoot one of us. But you admit the will was thrown into the fire. I admit that an old school essay was thrown into the fire. Since Lloyd can't read, he didn't know what was burned. This is the real document drafted by his father. Everything was on the line for us. Lloyd, he had a lot on the line too. But what he had on the line came down to dollars in his pocket. We were here for something bigger, and I don't know if we knew it when we started, but this wasn't just an, about an inheritance, or maybe it was, but a different kind of inheritance. What we were hearing about from the newspapers covering the case made us think in terms we hadn't thought of before. Hope. We weren't just here for ourselves now. Our hope was everyone's hope. Then my brother Edward was called to the stand. Objection! What exactly is your objection? The prosecutor shall refrain from referring to any freed slaves in this room as family members of Mr. Ford. It has already been established in writing and with witnesses that Edward, Peg, Lark, John, and Rhoda, freed slaves, are the children of Lloyd Ford, Sr. Objection overruled. They ain't his proper children. They certainly ain't my kin, and they got no right to go up on that stand as if they were a person. Their testimony don't even count. They got no more say in this court than any of my father's other property. What are you going to do next? Call up the dining room table? One of the horses? Their property, not people. By all standard rights, my property. Order. The defense shall restrain his client. And there it was, finally. What he said out loud is what other people were wondering in silence. The questions and evidence went on for days. The whole time I felt Lloyd's eyes burning into me, figuring, wanting to count me out. But before he could do that, he needed to understand how to count me at all. It used to be easy to count me. I was three-fifths. When the census rolled around, each slave was counted as three-fifths of a person. Me, my family, my family before me. From the time we were taken from our own country and brought to the shores of this one, three-fifths, I look at myself and I wonder about that because I don't see anything missing. I think that unnerves you the most, Mr. Lloyd Ford, Jr. And I think that's what unnerved your daddy. You don't know how to count me anymore. And maybe he didn't either. If I was his flesh and blood, then what happens to those numbers? 
does something change? One whole multiplied by three-fifths. What? Do you get a number, a new number? Knowing you're kin to me, do any of the numbers make sense at all? That's what this case comes down to, Mr. Ford, doesn't it? This is a lot bigger than money. If I'm free, if I'm not a slave, which the law states is three-fifths, then what am I? We are not property, but people. We, the people. And if the free people are counted the same as you, the free people, then maybe it makes it harder to look at other people and count them any differently. People who contain the same humanity as me, as you, as our Father, all made by one heavenly Father. Lawyers representing Lord Ford Jr. tried to establish that their fathers was insane, that the hells were untrustworthy, that the will was a forgery. One after another, the claims were proven false. Lawyers for each side made their final statements. It was now in the hands of the Washington County jury. You, the people, how did you vote? Order, order. At no other time in history has a case like this come before a court in the state of Tennessee or the United States. The good people of Washington County swore to deliver a verdict based on the facts provided, which the foreman has just delivered. The members of the Washington County jury in the case of Ford versus Ford find the will is valid and further upholds all rights and grants provided in the will. This became a landmark case for the cause of slaves and free slaves, not just in Washington County and not just in the state of Tennessee, but would be the first major case in the United States that would look at the plight of slaves and their rights as people. 20 years before the Civil War, this case would become a turning point. The decision of one man and his will, the decision of one family to stand up for him, the decision of one woman to bring a case on their behalf, the decision of 12 men in Washington County, the decision of more than six different judges through several, several appeals, each decision was made by one person. And person by person, year by year, we strive to continue to become, we the people, together and equal. We will get there together one day. Thank you, Paul. Phyllis, do you have a tally for tonight's Tally Jewels. Wow. We went over. <laughs> now I know you all you all want to know when this is gonna happen, right? Well, mark your calendars. The special guest on our radio show in May is none other than the snake lady. Connie. And our very own jewels will be draping of the snake. That's May 24th. You don't want to miss it. You did it, and I seriously wouldn't be draped with a snake without you, so thank you. <laughs> no, really, thank you so much. Thank, it, it means so much to us to know that you're there, that you care. Um, we're, Ian is thanking some of the people who have contributed tonight on, on, on the thread, and um, we will continue to thank more of you on our Facebook page. Uh, throughout the week. Thank you so much. We are almost at our full goal, and I appreciate y'all so much. Now, we've got another segment coming up, but I just want to say, what about, what about these stories that we've heard tonight from right here in, in Jonesboro and Johnson City? They're amazing <laughs> history that's being uncovered. And these stories, they're not, just, they're not just to be heard in February. They're not just to be relegated to one of our programs. We try to bring diverse stories like this throughout the year, but we really wanted to give it special attention tonight. And that's why we're really excited to have these special guests, including our next guest and our final segment tonight, 
comes from our good friends, Black and Appalachia. We love their podcast. We listen to it as much as possible. If you haven't downloaded them yet, make sure that you do. Coming up next, we've got an episode from Black and Appalachia that actually touches on some folks right here in Johnson City. I hope you enjoy it as they take us out of tonight's show. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Right. Mm -hmm. When I think about my daughter, what is America going to look like when she grows up? You know, what are the challenges that are going to face her? And so it's really important. I was happy to see so many young folks out there, so many kids out there. But I'm really just want to kind of sit with and think about what we're what we're leaving for the youth. Right. Like we definitely need to leave space for them in organizing and movement work. And as we're seeing some of our past civil rights trailblazers like C.T. Vivian and John Lewis pass away, they're like leaving us the torch. So now we have to leave it for our children and those, you know, who are youth right now. Yeah, and I definitely think that they're ready. They're definitely ready to step up. We talked with Alana Norwood in Johnson City, Tennessee, right? And, you know, she talked about just all of the great work that, you know, her and other young folks, and they're joining with other people. They're joining with people in other generations, but they're doing great work in this region around organizing for racial justice. The young people in the Johnson City community, they're really important to the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole because they are the next generation of leaders. Sierra and Elijah Gilmer, they are two young people in our community and they organized a demonstration in Founders Park in the wake of George Floyd's death. And it kind of got the ball rolling in our community and woke some people up and kind of um, encouraged people to come out. The first thing that really surprised me were just honestly how young they actually were and just them coming out with the energy and the motivation to organize in a city like Johnson City was uh, really inspirational. The youth particularly are in a good position to keep this movement going just because of the tech savvy skills that they have. They may not even realize that they're really good with technology, social media posts and like little TikTok things. It just keeps the movement relevant. I think the Appalachian youth experience is different in certain ways, and one of those ways is it's very community-based. You know your neighbor's story, and you know their cousins and their extended family. Um, it's easy to you know, make these like relationships with people in your community because you see them all the time. I think in that way, we do have, we have community on our side. As the weeks go by and the months roll on, just keeping that energy and the momentum alive for the movement to continue has been really impressive because, I mean, I'm only 21 and I'm already kind of getting tired. So they've been keeping the energy going for sure. So, yes, yeah, speaking of keeping the energy going, the young people are doing a great job. And Alana's commentary on that and the future of the movement really begs the question for me. And that is how can we make sure that Emancipation Day, Juneteenth, and all of the celebrations that we're seeing are preserved? And how can we continue on with observing this day nationwide? So um, as we close the episode out, I think we've, you know, talked about a lot. But one way that we can make sure Emancipation Day is preserved is to continue this movement, continue organizing continue the work, not let the momentum die down. Like before, like you said, we would see all these cases of police brutality and everything, and then, you know, our emotions would be high, and then we would just, like, lose sight, I believe, of, you know, what we were fighting for. But, like, right here and right now, we can't let that happen. If we keep screaming, keep resisting, and make sure, you know, that black joy and our history and everything in between is a constant thing, I think that in and of itself will help to make sure that, you know, these Emancipation Days and the celebrations continue from here on out. And I think that so much of our lives is taken up with the struggle and fighting oppression. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay for us to just have days where we're celebrating because we can. Right. We don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, sort of in response to something that was outrageous that happened to us because those you know, continue to happen. And that's just a part of life for black people in America. It's crazy and unfortunate, but that is, that's what we're doing all the time and we're tired. And Mm -hmm. so I think celebrating for the heck of celebrating, that's enough. And I think that it, like I said earlier, in it of itself, it's resistance, but just, you know, sometimes we don't have to carry the struggle with us all the time. Right. So I think it's important for black people to always remember that 
that we exist outside of whiteness. Like our life is not just about responding to white trauma or white oppression, but that we can just be and celebrate our blackness, enjoy who we are, whatever that looks like, however it comes. So I think there's definitely, it's important to remember that aspect of Emancipation Days and our celebration of ourselves. now or tomorrow. Thank you, Black in Appalachia. And uh, thank you to all of our storytellers and our story collectors. And thank you, our audience. Thank you so much for helping us reach the goal that we wanted to reach tonight. And we're almost to our complete total. Thank you. Our stories are important. And that just shows that you think they are too. We'll see you next month. <laughs>